We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. That's Emily. It is, as as you watch this, it is race week, but we are recording this. It is not currently a, ra- a race week. We are between races. We will be heading to China we hope probably I'm we're, still, we're, not we're still not convinced. Um, there's a the lot of, of my conspiracy theory career. Oh, I love it. Um, there, there are a lot of things to discuss um, in, in Formula One news, Fernando Alonso's new contract, the 2025 calendar, Joe Guan used China helmet. Um, I'm sure there will be more things by the time we get to, to recording the predictions episode, but that will all be in the predictions episode um, that will come out later this week. Um, but today we are going to dive back into our educational series, F101, to talk about young drivers and the driver development program. Yes, yes, yes. And like we did our F1 Academy, F101, we were doing this interview style. Um, Catherine did a bunch of research and I honestly had a bunch of questions um, about the Young Drivers Program and just driver development programs in general. So we, I have questions to ask her. She did a bunch of research, so hopefully she can answer all my questions. If not, we'll do more research and answer the questions. Yep. Um, but yeah, so... Welcome to another episode of our F101s. Yeah, if you're watching this on YouTube, we have a whole playlist full of F101s that you can watch. It'll be linked up top. Um, And if you are uh, listening to us on a podcast platform, go over to our YouTube channel and watch those episodes there so you don't have to scroll and figure out which ones are F101 episodes in our archive. There you go. All right. So I'm going to start off by just kind of generally asking why... Why young drivers? Why do we care? What's it about? Just like baseline. First of all, what is the young drivers program? I we should probably start there for people who don't know. We are early on in this season. If people are just starting getting into um, Formula One this season, we've only seen one young driver drive so far. But can you kind of explain one what it is baseline and two like why do we care? Why are we even doing an F one one on it? Yeah, so so the reason why we we care about, you know, before we go into like the young driver programs, driver development programs, why we care about young drivers is because you know, Fernando Alonso, for all that he is going to drive forever, he can't actually drive forever. Take it back. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but at at some point the physics of the car and the physics of of the body will not intersect the way they continue to do. Obviously this is, you know, Fernando Alonso, I think he he wants to be driving, you know, way way off into the sunset. Um but, you know, fo- we, you know, we we all love the like, current tr- crop of F1 drivers and especially if you're getting into Formula 1 from Drive to Survive or a friend get drags you forcefully into Formula 1 by showing you a battle between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen in 2021 um you you know you you get a really great introduction there's 10 teams 20 drivers so it's really easy to keep track of everyone but there are so many other drivers waiting in the wings to replace these top 20 um maybe soon to be 22 24 if we get some new teams on the grid eventually and Jenny has their way <laughs> i mean it, it, andretti is 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 working working toward it um and we'll pro you know i i i expect him to see i expect to see them on on the grid at some point but we we want to know who's waiting in the wings and the driver development programs are what f1 teams and also other motorsport organizations indycar super, super formula nascar they all have their own you know similar young driver programs but it is their efforts to identify support and advance promising young drivers through the racing series so if you look at other lower series not all of those drivers are sponsored by these uh, driver development programs but you do have a great number of them who are um and it allows them to you know keep growing the crop of drivers that are you know intended to be fed into the current teams that we have on the grid pause for me there so what you're saying is in like f2 f3 there are drivers on those grids who don't belong to a driver development program correct so you have a lot of say like for example f2 f3 drivers some of them have other sponsorships they're not specifically you know a mclaren driver development program the mercedes junior team the red bull academy things like that okay 
And is there a benefit to them for not being with a program? Like is the sponsorships, are the sponsorships better or is it, you know, better to align yourself with a driver development program? I mean, I personally think that if you have a chance to be recognized by one of the top teams in motorsport, the teams that have have for, you know Formula One drivers on the grid, then then you're always gonna gonna want to be a part of those organizations. Um, sometimes there are issues with the young driver programs, which we'll get into in a little bit. But you know, if you are picked by the Mercedes, you know, to be represented by the Mercedes Junior team, then that probably means that Mercedes has their eye on you and you're really really good and they want to see you get better and they're willing to put money behind you getting even better than you already are yeah okay so that makes sense of why you would go along with an f1 team in their development program versus just kind of not i mean obviously i'm sure everyone wants to be in a driver development program get the extra attention but like what so that there's like that benefit of it right with the yeah they're there are, there are a lot of benefits, exposure, you know, you, you get seen by sponsors, you have the opportunity to, you know, test older F1 cars, you know, there's also the young driver, um, free practice sessions that we've got now, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth later. Um, but you know, every formula one team has one of these driver development programs. Um, and you know, the goal is to get these drivers into their, their seats, unless you're, you know, Oscar Piastri who Alpine, he was an Alpine driver and an Alpine Academy driver and Alpine invested a lot of money for him to go to McLaren. Um, but that went down to some, we, we know there are issues at Alpine at this point, And a lot of them are related to, you know, the back end and there's some, you know, contracts issues that came from it, but everyone has one, obviously Red Bull and the RB team, V Carb, they share. Um, but Emily, I want you to guess, um, of the nine driver development programs, which one do you think is the oldest driver development program? I this say is kind Ferrari. of a trick question. I want to say Ferrari, just because it's like the only team that's maintained to be one team for the longest um or are you talking like legacy too no no just the 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 um young driver programs i want to say ferrari but knowing ferrari they are not smart enough to do this um red bull is a very new team so is mercedes alpine was renault McLaren? McLaren, actually, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. I'm so Mc- glad I put thought into that. <laughs> McLaren established their young driver program in 1998. Um, and as you can guess, um, Lewis Hamilton was one of those first drivers in oh, that's um, so weird. in the in the young driver program. Yeah, he he was we for all that his success with um, Mercedes is just so you know blatant and out there. He started his career at McLaren, and he started yeah. with McLaren in 1998 um and you know he's he's not the only one on the grid who had his their start in the mclaren academy you have alex albon kevin magnuson nick devries uh lando norris obviously so there are a lot uh, you know of, of drivers on the grid who got their start with mclaren and they have the the current oldest one wow yeah that seems like okay again emily and time we don't we are not right friends. 1998 seems like Oh, that's not that long ago. Because I'm still convinced t- 2000 was like two years ago. So I'm like, oh, that's like four years ago. But it's really like nope. 26 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, My brother and sister were born that year and they are adults. It's so weird to think. Um, yeah. Well, interesting. No, I, I totally would have guessed Ferrari. But like I said, Ferrari doesn't seem like... That was my thought too. Because, you know, Ferrari is, is you know, one of the... the oldest formula one teams but yeah. no they didn't start theirs until 2009 so this this concept of a young driver driver development program is newer ferrari is not the newest obviously you have some newer teams who of course established right. theirs within the last 10 years but yeah it, it's you know this this overall this this desire to directly influence the careers of young drivers is a newer concept And I guess maybe I'm jumping ahead, but this is how my brain works. So I guess the incentive for teams to do this is to kind of farm the younger drivers, 
get them to drive the way that you want them to drive and driving in your car so that when it comes time for a seat to open up, you have kind of a roster to look at and pick more directly than just kind of being like, oh, well, this guy was good in Formula 2, so maybe he'll be good in Formula 1. Exactly. And, you know, it's it's this is – not a large world. The the world of motorsport right. and Formula One is is very very small in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it is about making sure that your current success is going to continue into the future when your drivers decide to retire and move on to other teams, um, and or to create new success where you may not already have. As if you're you know looking at this like longer five year ten year plan type of thing that some teams are looking towards. Um, so you've guessed the the oldest uh, driver development program on the grid. Now I want you to guess the driver development program that predates its team joining the F1 grid. Um, I would think that would be Red Bull. Yes. Yes. Look at me yeah. and my knowledge. Yeah. So Red Bull, as, as we know, joined the Formula One grid in 2005. Their driver development program uh, started in 2001. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I was just like, oh, that, that's a that's a fun little little factoid that we want to throw in there, um, which I thought it was it was very interesting that like we're going to foster young drivers for a team that doesn't exist yet. But that's smart. I mean, starting to work in the lower circuits and make your way up. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And it gave us Max Verstappen that we have now. So clearly it worked. Yeah. And, and the other thing to add before we, we keep going is these driver development programs are not big. These are, you know, at most 10 drivers. That was going to be my next question. Like, what's the breakout between, you know, F2, F3, other circuits? Um, how many are in each program? Does it vary based on team? Yeah, so it, it really does vary, vary based on team. Looking at... Um, the F2 roster right now, there are 22 odd drivers, you know, in, in F2, but, you know, look, looking at, you know, the Alpine Academy, that's a bigger one. They've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They've got 10 drivers. You've got Aston Martin. They have four. Um, so it, and, you know, Ferrari has one, two, three, they have six. So there's not a lot, you know, of of these drivers. There are, are very few, um, scattered throughout the, you know, the lower series, other series. If, uh, if if you look at, um, Ayumu Uwasa, who he drove for Daniel Ricciardo in, um, Suzuka in the first free, um, young driver appearance that we've had in the 2024 season, he is a member of the the Red Bull Junior team he's driving for Super Formula so he's not in the direct feeder towards F1 but he is in one of the lower feeder series in motorsport that gives you super license points that allows you to you know advance and you know ultimately get to Formula One off the cuff question here sure but I'm interested sorry I'm just gonna throw random questions at you do that um so Formula One you're yes. in a Red Bull seat and your contract is up and you jump to McLaren or Mercedes or Haas, right? Sure. Is that something that happens in these um, driver development programs? Like maybe you're racing under Red Bull Juniors and you're in it for two years and it's just not a good fit. Is there switching between the different development programs or is it most typical to see someone just like stick it out with one and then if a seat does become available at a different team then they would go but only if they're jumping you know into a formula one seat yeah no it's it's i don't know necessarily how common it is but look at alex albon he started in the mclaren driver development program and then moved to the red bull team okay um so, and and as as a young driver whereas you know lewis hamilton got to the grid with mclaren won a championship with mclaren and then moved to mercedes he wasn't part of their junior team um so I, I don't necessarily know how common it is, but it happens from time to time. And then you have a driver like Esteban Ocon, who started in the Mercedes junior team. Obviously, now he's driving for Alpine, <laughs> but um, he's currently being managed by Toto Wolff and is technically still like under that umbrella of the Mercedes team driver program. It's so complex. 
Like it, it seems really is cut and dry, but it's not. And like no. the whole like George had to go prove himself at Williams, and then he got to come over to Mercedes, but he's always like Ben and Merce. It's I don't. Get well, it. well, yeah, that's that's you know to 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 specifically speak on the relationship between Mercedes and Williams, that really just boils down to the fact that. Williams hasn't been the strong contender that they were in their heyday. So, you know, they have this partnership with Mercedes where they bring on Mercedes drivers like, you know, Lance Stroll, I believe, um, was at McLaren or not at, at, at Williams for, for a minute. Um, and obviously George Russell is, is one of the most notable. He was there to get experience um, before Toto decided to kick Valtteri Bottas off the team kidding um but they they did move in that direction um so that you know george could be on the grid getting some good experience give williams a good driver on the cheap um to give him experience to get ready for doing well at mercedes and then mercedes just stopped develop stop being able to develop a good car which is unrelated to the actual plan yeah so okay thinking this through with all that and the movement and stuff because I'm thinking if each team has let's say average six right so there's nine development programs and you know six drivers about 54 people are are in this development program on average let's say give or take take. yeah jinx um we can do that because we have U.S. Wi-Fi and not Argentina Wi-Fi yes (laughs) anyways so 54 ish there's only 20 seats available on the grid and it's not like we're rotating through all 20 constantly. So right. is that something that, like, do some people just kind of fizzle out? Like, I, I just don't see how, like, I get the point of it, but it seems like a lot of people would be kind of stuck in this waiting pattern. Oh, yeah, th- that's, you know, there are some, I wouldn't say drawbacks, but there are some, you know, problems with the young driver programs fundamentally the fact that there's not you know the these contracts are are oddly enough getting longer and longer for some drivers you know max verstappen is contracted till 2028 charles leclerc is contracted till 2029 um Lando Norris is contracted to, I think, 2028 as well. Um, Does Lance, Lance Stroll, Stroll have a contract? Has, has, a, has, a, has a forever contract, um, you know, th- things like that. So you do have, you know, a point where you do kind of, if your goal is Formula One, you're going to get stuck. And I think the most notable is Felipe Drugovic. He is um, a reserve driver at Aston Martin. He has been waiting in the wings for Formula One drive forever and the the likelihood of him having that opportunity just gets slimmer and slimmer slimmer every year because you do have the ceiling and it's not even necessarily the fact that you know you're in the Red Bull driver program and you've got the Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez and then you've got you know the people waiting in the wings for those two seats are technically at V-Carb um there there's you know there's just not a lot of opportunity on the grid period for new drivers right. these days well it's because to me like young drivers program great but you know when do you kind of age out because you can't be in this program for years and years and years and then come to the grid because everyone made such a big deal when Nick DeVries came to the grid as a rookie as a 27 year old right he's considered old mm-hmm. but if you know we have seasons like we do 2024 where the grid is the exact same as the last season and there are no, you know, changes. And if we do have these Fernando Alonzos and Lewis Hamiltons who stick around forever, um, it just seems like people will be stuck in, you know, Formula 2 or they'll have to go to a different series in order to – or they'll be a reserve driver forever. But that just doesn't seem like it would, you know, be – Exciting. Yeah, so so there it's and and to be honest it's it's not always really exciting, you know, and there it's not like there's a lot of money in in you know being a young driver, you know, uh, Liam Lawson, he came out in a, in a couple of interviews, you know, last season, like there's no money in what he's doing right now. Like obviously he gets, you know, free flights and everything to the races that he's a reserve driver for. Um but unless you're in Formula 1, you're not making the money. And sometimes it does mean us see you know potential young drivers become reserve drivers become you know 
um, oh, develop developmental drivers. I need to, I need to look this up real quick because um, there is um, Charles Leclerc's brother Arthur. Right, he he's was now like a development driver for Ferrari. Yeah, exactly. I wanna I wanna see I, I wanna specifically see because I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. He is left um the driver academy and is now yeah he's the development driver now so you know it's it's sometimes it means you know going into this role of doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff robert kibitza um who was a driver on the grid for for years he has a very long fascinating history um and he kind of you know left the grid came back to the grid left the grid and he did a lot of driver development work in the background once he kind of you know reached his his plateau of where he you know he wasn't gonna always be you know seeking you know spots on on newer better teams um but you know it, it it's one of those things where if it wants you you want to stay around you'll do that if not you'll go to you know somewhere like indycar um in, well, in the, the states because fernando alonso when he like retired mm-hmm. for two years he was still helping develop mclaren yeah, and he he was also you know ra- racing elsewhere for for a bit. But there there are so yeah. like there are so many racing series out there that like you know even give you the opportunity of this you know of getting the super license points that you need to you know be able to be an F one driver. And, and we'll get to the specifics on that in in a minute. But like there are you know for for all that Formula One is the pinnacle of motorsport, there are a lot of other options out there if you want to drive cars really fast make cars go fast broom. yes okay so i do want to touch on this the super license because i feel like it's this thing that exists and everyone's like oh yeah the super license oh yeah someone got a point on their super license what does that mean yeah um so i know you need one in order to get into f1 but like what else surrounds the super license and like how else do you get to formula one because i'm guessing there's different avenues by just other than you know young driver programs development or driver development programs. Yeah, so so the 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 one that kind of stands out with like other avenues would be um, Colton Herta, um, who he was being eyed by Red Bull for a seat. He's an IndyCar driver, um, but the issue there was he didn't have enough points for his super license, and Red Bull kind of went to the FIA to ask for an exemption um, that they were not granted for reasons that could or could not be seen as as legitimate. What's interesting to me is like the super license, you know, the qualifications to have one do change over the years. Like right now, you need to be a minimum of 18 years old at the start of your first F1 race, and you need to have a valid road driver's license. And there's a very specific driver who stands out who didn't have either of those things and is currently a three-time world champion. And Max Verstappen. Exactly. And I, I do think... <laughs> that it's kind of jokingly referred to as the Max Verstappen rule because those qualifications for getting your super license were added after Max got to to the grid. Um, But it's one of the, the keys here is you have to accumulate at least 40 points for your super license over the last three series in any, you know, combination of championships. And there are like 30 different options for championships that you can be a part of um, that give you points based on where you finish in the driver standings. Um, Formula two is the most that you can get. You can get, you know, 40 points that you need by finishing first, second, or even third. Um, You can get 30 points for fourth, 20 for fifth, and it goes on down to 10th. Um, And that's kind of the, the biggest grab of super license points in the on the FIA side of things other than IndyCar which also does give you a lot of points depending on where you finish in the standing so there is a path but of you know joining the Formula One grid through IndyCar it's just a little bit more complicated with like the sponsorship side and drive and you know the awareness side of things in my opinion right so you only need a super license to get into F1 F2 and F3, you can get points to get a super license, but you don't need a super license to be in those. It, it is a super license. And then the number of points that you have on your super license is what gets you to Formula One. So, you know, okay. it's it's not just, you know, me with my cute little Arizona driver's license can start driving cars really fast. Um, but there there are a ton of, of series, um, some currently defunct series there. Um, 
their super license points, you know, you can still use those for a couple of years. Most, you know, notably, um, the one that stands out to me just looking at it is the W series, which right. if you finish first in the W series and were named Jamie Chadwick, you got 15 points to your super license. And even though the series folded in 2022 though those points don't expire until after 2025 so there are a few series that are currently defunct that are still you know those those points are still available to you know allow you to move up into other series gotcha 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 yeah there are so many other things about like that, that's like barely scratching the surface on on super licenses but for the the point of a young driver getting to formula one is you need 40 points over the seasons you can get points um in other ways like logan Sargent, notably he got um he had a couple of super license points that he needed which he got doing the young driver test he did those for williams um you can get a point for driving 100 kilometers in a practice session so that's one of the the big things for his um if you remember it to, back to 2022 was like he had to yeah. finish all of free practice to get the 100 kilometers in to get the super license points because um and then you know depending on where he finished in F2 would have determined how many super license points he would get and so it was like a little bit of a question of would he have the super license points for Williams to offer him the contract I remember that. Yeah. And it's like he might be one point off. So then he did like another test or something like that. I remember that. Exactly. Yeah. So it's there. there's a lot of, um, you know, ways that you can kind of sneak in a couple. But the biggest is like when, you know, finishing the top three of the driver championship in F2 is kind of the, the big deal type of thing. Got it. So talking about these develop driver development program, I don't know. I can can't say that. Um, driver development programs. So are there any like right now? Cause I know that they're newer, let's say, you know, the first one starting in 1998, we already kind of talked about how, you know, Max Verstappen was with one and, um, it was Hamilton, but right now, currently, um, who are kind of the notable drivers in these programs? What teams do they drive for? Do we care about them? Have we heard their name? I know one of them we have because he's actually raced this year. Yeah, um, our man Ollie Behrman. Yeah, raced for uh, Ferrari. Um, but are there any others that we should like keep our eyes on for you know potentially getting a seat? I know it's like you know musical chairs uh, for a seat in twenty twenty five. So are there any that could potentially pop in there, or what do we think? Yeah, so I I was looking at. Um... I, I was looking at some stuff last night and there are, there are definitely a few that really stand out. Um, obviously Ollie Behrman, he, he's the, you know, he's a reserve driver. He's a Ferrari driver, Academy driver. He drove for Carlos Sainz when Carlos Sainz had to take his appendix out because appendix. Um, but the other name that we have heard a lot of this season is Kimi Antonelli, who is mm -hmm. currently the most decorated junior driver I've seen in, you know, all of the research, like he has qualifications up the wazoo, um, and is basically like the second coming of Michael Schumacher. Um, so he's, he's a, he's a really big Don't name. tell Max Verstappen. I know, right? <laughs> um, the other one from the Mercedes junior team that I want to point out is actually Dorian Pond, who is, um, um, she's currently leading the F1. Is she currently leading? No, she's not leading the, the F1 Academy Championship right now, but probably will be when um, after we get through Miami. Um, she's the current favorite. She is leaps and bounds uh, ahead of, of the rest of that grid. Um, you know, she she's and all of the F1 Academy drivers are also you know, they have also been signed to junior teams, which has, has, you know, brought a little bit of, a, of expansion. Um, so she's definitely, you know, a notable driver development program um, driver to keep an eye on. Um, another two are actually from the Sauber Academy, which is hilarious considering how Sauber's kind of struggling a lot. Um, but you have reigning F2 champion, Teo Porcher is a member of the Sauber Academy. And the current F2 championship leader, I know it's only been like four races, um, is Zane Maloney, who is also from the Sauber Academy. Um, and those are, you know, when you're looking, you know, who are the top guys and who are, you know, the top, you know, the top potential drive, you know, teams with seats that could open um that that's where the, those you know will really kind of stand out and be like hmm, maybe we should look at these guys 
Okay, another quick question Mm -hmm. because I'm curious about this. We call it the Young Drivers Program, right? Or driver development programs, whatever. They participate in Young Driver Tests. Um, Are they all, like, babies or are some of them, like – because I know Ollie's, like, what, 18? Yeah, the the idea is – So is this kind of where they go when they're, like – before they meet the requirements of being 18 and having a road license and exactly to go into yes okay. yeah that's exactly so these are like what children. this is. yeah like Kimmy Antonelli is like 16 17 years old like these these are not old people like these 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 kids they're children they, these kids can't drink yet in Europe let alone in the United <laughs> States um that's it, when you know you're really young is if you can't drink in Europe exactly i remember there was an somebody was being interviewed in Vegas last season. I think it was in like after a, like a post qualifying show or maybe a post race show. And he was asked like, Oh, what are you going to be doing after this? The rest of your time in Vegas. And he's like, I can't drink yet in the United States. I think it might've been Jack Dewan, who is the um, current lead Alpine Academy driver. um, Who's kind of, he's, he's, he kind of fit into the, the void that Oscar Piastri left when Oscar silly season, 2022, when, when when the Oscar thing happened, it's, it's linked up there. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we do have some potential for some young drivers to come out of these development programs and possibly hit the grid if our musical chairs ends up with an open seat. Yeah, and it might not be next year. It might be the year after. I'm sure that, you know, a lot of the drivers, you know, once we get through 2025 and get to this new regulation, some of the older drivers uh, who aren't Fernando Alonso might make a different decision of whether or not they're going to want to stay and continue driving um, based on, you know, I I think it's going to be a pretty significant change um, and that could lead to a lot of upheaval on the grid. So it's, it's, you know, really a question of, you know, we're, we may not be talking about next year. We might not be talking about two years. We might be talking about like three years out here with some of these young drivers. Next question for you then. Yeah. Next. So I'm a team, right? Whatever. And I see that Logan Sargent, free agent, right? Could potentially be signed. He has two years under his belt. Haven't been the best, but he still has F1 experience for two solid years yeah so what would my incentive be to you know pluck someone out of f2 probably not f3 but f2 and like a development program overtaking an experienced driver like are they as prepared as f1 drivers or is it just like gambling on someone who's done really well who knows how to drive like hopefully they you know it translates to f1 or like what's the you know what i mean like what would the benefit be or is there a benefit or you know, is Logan just, and I'm not meaning, it could be anyone, right? But I, yeah. just, I just used him as an example. It, it's really a question of what do you want? It, it, this is all my opinion, that it's like, what do you want for okay. the future of your team? Do you think you're going to get more of a return, more of a, a progression up through the constructor standings and up through the driver standings with Logan Sargent or insert available driver here versus young driver. I think, you know, l- let's use the example of Kimi Antonelli and Mick Schumacher. Um, you know, Mick Schumacher right. has Formula One experience. Kimi Antonelli is the second coming. Um, so it's right. really a question of what do these teams expect out of these drivers to come in and make an impact? Because the reason I kind of bring this up is because of what happened with Haas, right? They went to rookies and it didn't go well no. for them and then they went and flipped instead of continuing on that route they went back to the we're going to get some really seasoned you know experienced drivers because that's where we think you know our our team direction needs to go but it just makes me think like are they per prepared enough to come into f1 or our team's going to keep ref- going back to you know people who are more experienced 
And that's a really good question. And we we touched on this a little bit after Ali Behrman drove in Saudi Arabia in in the in the Saudi Arabia recap of, you know, there there was a question posed on social media after that race of, you know, should F1 teams be obliged to race a, you know, you know, race a rookie in an actual race rather than just a practice session and you and I kind of settled on we adamantly said no 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 (laughs) hell no absolutely not um and the real question is is f2 and f3 doing enough to prepare drivers for f1 because we know that f2 specifically um is a slower series than f1 all the series are slower than than f1 um even indycar is slower than F1. So the the question is, you know, and this this is I don't know if this, this is necessarily the fault of the driver development program. I don't think it is as opposed to the fault of the available chassis um, and the available engines that we use in these lower series that at this point, I think Formula One is not it is way far outpacing any developmental upgrades that they decide to bring to the lower series that right. we need we need F2 and F3 to improve more and to you know get faster and get better so that these drivers are not having as much of a gap of experience between F2 and F1 yeah and i feel like that could be a push down effect from these uh development programs as well of like hey we want to develop our our drivers more do more to help like bridge this gap you know what I mean like the pressure needs to come from the teams I feel like exactly exactly and you know hopefully that that will change and you know that will that will improve and that will you know get us to a position where we're not having you know somebody sorry to use Logan Sargent as an example again but Logan Sargent who did you know he he finished I believe top five in F2 in 2022 um and you know got to to Williams and was floundering for a good portion of the season no and and I think that's a really good point and you know to bring up this you know free practice one young drivers test again that we've you know kind of sprinkled throughout the pod um, this is kind of their only experience to drive an F1 car before they're like in a seat. Right? Well, I, I want to push back on that a little cars. bit. So, okay, well, because it's, it's, this is in my, th- it's, so you're, you're right, but it is, they are, this is their first opportunity to get into the current F1 car. Because they have opportunities okay, right, to drive yes. and test the older cars, but to, you know, the Formula One at the FIA, they established the FP1 young driver test to get young drivers, get rookie drivers experience in the current cars. With the current regulations, the current upgrades. Yes. Everything. Cause, okay, because if they're part of these, you know, development programs, they have access to the older cars, they can still go out and test those, get that experience. But for the current most up-to-date, this is the only time that they can get in that car. It 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 really is is it, it it's not really necessarily the only time, but it's one of the best times because you're in as close to racing sim as you as an F right uh, as a young driver will get into FP two. They're running specific programs, um, and and things like that, and because you know these young drivers have have opportunities to to you know, test in the, the older cars. Um, Leah Block, who is one of the F1 Academy drivers, she's ha- she's just posted about having her seat fit in one of the older Williams cars um, because she's going to be doing some some driving at the um, Festival of Speed coming up in, in a few weeks, I believe. So, um, so they have some opportunities, but when it comes to, you know, get, you know, being on an F1 track surrounded by other F1 drivers, that is not always something that you know drivers necessarily have been able to experience prior to the 2022 right. season right because that's when it was established like teams have to do this they have to participate right yeah yeah it is it so is now a rule it is a regulation it is it's it's not something that it's optional anymore 
So what is the regulation then? Like they have to, they, it's not, they opt in, they have to participate, but like, what's the requirements? The the requirement is teams have to give two practice sessions per season to a driver who has not competed in more than two Grands Prix. So Ollie Behrman has raced in one Grand Prix so far in his career, um, but he is still eligible to be um, the, the rookie driver of choice for, I, I think he's going to be driving for both Haas drivers. And I think he's also going to be driving for Charles Leclerc at some point this season too. So he'll get a bunch more practice in, even though he did really, really well in Saudi Arabia. Exactly. So, they, so you know, there, there's a really big push to get Ollie Behrman onto the grid soon. There's, you know, same with, you know, Kimi Antonelli, who's probably going to be the the guy from Mercedes um, for the for the young driver sessions. Obviously, it's very early in the year. We usually don't see these young driver tests until later in the season. You know, the the Brazils, the Mexicos, the Abu Dhabi. Yeah. There were so many in Abu Dhabi last year. Um, but the the other quirk is if you're actually a rookie, then your first practice session with the team counts towards the team's rookie session. So 2024 doesn't have any rookies, but last year, Oscar Piastri, Logan Sargent, and Nick DeVries, when they came out onto the grid in FP1 in Bahrain, that was considered their rookie session. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Which is why Oscar didn't, you know, have to bow out for a rookie, but Lando did. And, you know, Logan didn't, but Alex did. Huh. Yeah. So each driver has to give up one free practice for the year unless they're a rookie. Correct. Huh. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yes. The more you know. Um, okay, last question from my side. We can talk more if you want, but you mentioned um, Leah Block and her getting fit for Williams to do driving, right? Yeah. So do you think we'll see potentially young driver tests from F1 Academy participants? Because like you said, they're part of their development programs. Um, will we see that? Not maybe not this year, but in the future. Do you do you anticipate that? Just trying to round out our, yeah, our yeah, whole yeah, yeah, yeah. like thing here yeah so so that's actually why I brought up Dorian Pond in, in the you know young drivers to highlight is because she if there was a chance for a young you know for an F1 Academy driver to get an F1 practice session it would probably be her at this point okay. um at the same time I don't think we're gonna see one in, in the the next couple of years um you know maybe we'll see one next year um but Right now, you know, the F1 Academy is in its infancy. Um, and right. I I believe that it will have a better trajectory than, say, the W Series. But, you know, even Max Verstappen came out last week, somewhat recently, and said that the F1 Academy is not doing enough to get female drivers into F1. And he's right. Because um, the cars aren't fast enough. Right. The, the cars are very slow. I, I remember watching um, the opener and comparing the the, qualifi- the qualifying times of the opener to the qualifying times for the F1 cars. And they were about, I think, somewhere between 40 and 50 seconds off. So these these cars are not comparatively fast. But at the same time, the more eyes we get on the F1 Academy, the more support we get for the F1 Academy, the more advanced they're going to be able to upgrade those chassis. Because, you know, to note, this is a spec series. So every like, like F2 and F3, the F1 Academy is driving the same car. Yeah. Interesting. I know. I I hate to, like, pat Max for stepping on the I back, know you do. His comments about how, like, we have to do better. They have to get faster cars. That's the only way that we're going to get, you know, female drivers into F1. I was like, oh, you're so right, Matt. Well, well, right. And that that's always been the question with Jamie Chadwick because, you know, Jamie Chadwick, yeah. who is a Williams Academy driver, and I think she's also got some ties to, to Mercedes just because they're – the both teams are basically the same organization. Um, they're not, but it just feels like it sometimes. Um, but you know, there there was a question of you know what you know is Jamie Chadwick you know going to ever get on the F one grid as a driver? And the answer was always a resounding no. Um, but she was kind of the the standout on the side of women in the W series. So you know, do I see a future of F one Academy drivers having those opportunities to drive in those young driver practice sessions? Absolutely. Do I see it coming in the next couple of years? Not unless it's like Dorian Pond and she's like eight hundred points up in the championship. Right. 
No, I think it's interesting how how much slower even F2 is compared to F1. And that's where it goes back um, to is F2 doing enough to prepare drivers for F1. Right. right. So that's so F1 Academy is not the only problem here. It, the, you know, no. all all of the lower series are go not figure an pacing. international sports series with issues. Right? So <laughs> so it's, you know, but but are they making good progress of advancing female drivers through the series yes they have yes. the um the agreement you know for formula regional to take the top two so so f1 academy drivers are advancing out of f1 academy and as we've said in the f1 academy season preview like that's the goal of the f1 academy is to get right. drivers out and into the other series it's a launch pad it's not you know, a final resting place. Yeah, and maybe the launch pad isn't currently going F1 Academy, F3, F2, but it's going into an upper series to follow. Right. And I do believe, as you know, as long as we continue to have eyes on this, to continue to have these major sponsorships coming in and all this focus, that it'll get to a point where we are seeing, you know, better cars, faster cars, and we are seeing, you know, female drivers continuing to move closer and closer to F1. No, 100%. I think it can only go up from here. It, we're in the real, like, first big year of them being tied to F1. Exactly. Um, so I think, you know, as they develop, it'll get better. So. Yeah, exactly. So is Max right right now? Yes. Is he going yes. to be con- – is, is the statement going to continue to be accurate? I don't believe so. Not with the work right. that Susie Wolf is doing. Oh, God love her. Yeah. She's amazing. Oh, well, this has been really, like, not to sound, uh, this is no zero sarcasm. It's been super interesting and insightful, and now I know more about why we should care about the young drivers, because, you know, good old Fernando Alonso won't be around forever. But, right. Um, this has been fun. I actually enjoyed this. Yeah, and, like, even yeah. even this, and we've been talking for, you know, 45 minutes about this, is, like, scratching the surface of, you know, what we have and, you know, the the whole concept of super licenses and the whole concept of like becoming a young driver like look at you know Sergio Perez and Daniel Ricardo as examples of like if you want to become an F1 driver you have to leave your home and you know move to Europe leave your entire yeah. family behind pray that you have you know some really good sponsorship you know Sergio Perez comes with the backing of a lot of major Mexican telecom um which is another reason why he is desirable on the grid Zhou Guan Yu has a lot of Chinese backing with lots of money who love seeing a Chinese driver on the grid um yeah. so all of you know all of these things are are factors that lead you to Formula One. Don't guarantee success, but the existence of these existence of these young driver programs really like if you are joining a young driver program, it means you have a ton of potential and they're seeing yeah. you on the grid in five, seven, eight years. Yeah. You know, other than the fact that Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton and Danny Ricardo and refuse, refuse to, to retire. retire. Sorry, retire, come back because I was bored. I felt like driving really, really fast again. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> yeah. God bless him. Well, up next, we will have our Chinese Grand Prix prediction coming out later this week. That has been our F101 Young Driver and Development Driver Program podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.